Hello, hello, folks. Welcome back. It is me, Shingi Mavima, uh, and I'm so glad to be back here. Uh, we, today, we are doing our third in the trilogy of lectures on North Africa. If you remember two videos ago, we spoke about the spread of Islam coming right from, from, from Middle East, right across North Africa. This was in the seventh century and so forth. Uh, then after that, we picked up circa 11th century. We spoke about the likes of Saladin, right? Um, the great anti-crusade Muslim hero. We spoke about uh, the rise of the Mamluks as a force to reckon with. We even spoke about the advent of the Ottoman Empire, as well as Morocco's resistance, right? Under the leadership of the likes of Al Mansour, resistance to, to Spanish, Portuguese, and Ottoman invasion, right? And even their own conquest, Morocco's conquest of the, of the, of the, of the, of the Songhai Empire and so forth. So now we're gonna pick it up from there. We really, you know, we really pick up here in the 18th century and we'll be talking about uh, some very important figures and some very important events. And I love talking about this section for two main reasons. The first reason is that as I've said before, a lot of people like to think about North Africa as being something different from, from Africa, right? Which is, which is nonsense. First of all, it's, it is literally nonsense because North Africa is indeed Africa. But also the, the cultural historic dynamics of North Africa cannot be separated from those of Sub-Saharan Africa, right? If you talk about Morocco, you talk about the Songhai Empire. If you talk about Egypt, you talk about uh, Sudan or what was called back then Nubia and so forth, right? We talk about, you can't talk about this place without talking about Ethiopia. You can't talk about, you know, and, and so forth. And all these things interact. The second reason is when we think about Africa on the global scene, right? In, in international affairs, especially in the modern era, the idea is that Africa has been an object of global of affairs, right? The colonized, the enslaved, where, where rogue uh, agents do whatever they want and, and so forth. And if you wanna talk about Africa, played an integral role in the, in the, in the, in the rede redemption, in the, in, the, in, the, in the dynamics of the world, we have to go back 2000 years ago and talk about ancient Egypt and talk about maybe a thousand years ago to Mansa Musa and so forth. Right, but here, when we look at these stories and, and this history from the 18th and the 19th century, we see that Africa was not only an object in, in, in these conversations, it was part and parcel of the dynamics and drove a lot of the change that happened there. So for example, last week or last video, I mentioned that Sidi Mohammed, Sidi Mohammed, who was the leader, the, the Moroccan, head of state at the end of the 18th century was the first head of state to recognize the rebel territories of North America as, an, as a sovereign nation, right? That's the United States. So the first person to acknowledge the United States, the first head of state to acknowledge the United States as a sovereign nation was the Moroccan head of state, which makes this undertold story a very important story in the in the in the in the modern history of the world, right? Because knowing what, what the US would go on to be to say this is where this starts is pretty remarkable. All right. So today we'll be talking about these places. And without further ado, I know I talked quite a bit in this intro, but I love you all so much and I don't get to talk to you as much as I would want. But without further ado, let's see if we can get to to the video here, uh, to the slide. All right, there we go. All right, so like I said, we're talking about North Africa in the 19th century. Uh, and without, you know, you'll see my pretty face at the end, we're cooking with gas, let's go. So as I was explaining, as I hinted at, North Africa by the end of the 18th century, right? By the end of the 1700s, in fact, going on before then, remember we say the advent comes in in the 1600s, but by this stage, North Africa is almost entirely under Ottoman, as is almost entirely part of the Ottoman Empire, as provinces of the Ottoman Empire, right? Now, this is important 
to also recognize that even as we acknowledge Ottoman influence in these spaces, we must also recognize that it was never, it was never, I mean, at this point, at one point it might have been more involved, right? But we saw that even when they came in, they let the Mamluks continue um, as some sort of rulers in Egypt. So even then it was never really that hands-on, but by this point, the, the rule of the Ottomans is very, very nominal. To say it was indirect rule, is to overstate what it was. It was just nominal, right? Um, the Turkish regions, right? The Turkish governors of the, of the North African provinces ruled their territories with no direct reference to the Sultan of Istanbul. So they are really just doing their own thing here. Right? And even within the territories themselves, most of their rule was restricted to the coastal fringes, which you can see here when you look at the map. Right, that even as they rule Egypt, it's not all of Egypt, even as they rule, you know, Libya, it's not all of Libya, it, you know, it's almost like just on the verge here. As we've already stated before, one North African country was prominently not um, part of the Ottoman Empire, and that was, remember, um, Morocco, Morocco. So it is at this point that the French are sort of starting to make moves into Algeria, right? Now, this is very important because when you think about the Algerian war going on, you know, in the 20th century and becoming the bloodiest of, 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 of anti-colonial wars with more than a million people dead, this, uh, this is where this conversation starts, right? Or if you wanna take a more lighthearted approach, if you're a soccer fan like me, if you want to understand how we end up with Karim Benzema, Zinedine Zidane, <laughs> Kylian Mbappe, who are of Algerian origin, all being, you know, arguably among the, the, the finest French players of all time. This is where this conversation began. Now, more Algeria, Algeria had been doing business with Napoleon, right? Napoleon Bonaparte, who you know, the military general at the time, right? In 17, beginning in 1798, the Algerian, you know, the Algerians supplied grain to the French army for Napoleon's invasion of Egypt. Now, this year is very important, right? They supplied grain for the, for the invasion of Egypt. Remember what I said about the fact that Ottoman rule was only just nominal at this stage. So the fact that Algeria, which is an Ottoman province, would provide grain for Napoleon to invade Egypt, which we'll talk a little more about, we'll talk in depth about, would provide grain to Napoleon to invade Egypt, shows that this, this you know, the, the, the regions, these provinces were acting of their own accord, right? Because there is no way you can understand it that Michigan provided grain to this other uh, to this other external entity so that they could uh, occupy Ohio, right? And I know that's, the, 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 but but you know I know I'm being a little facetious with that example. But think about any other part of any other empire, right? There is no way during the, the during the reign of, of of Spain that Peru would have provided the British grain for them to occupy Uruguay. You know, it sounds ridiculous when you think about it, but here it just shows that the Ottoman Empire was really not the unit that it used to be anymore, right? So anyway, they provide these grains and, you know, to Napoleon's uh, armies in the late 70s, in the 1790s. Subsequent governments, however, sub subsequent French governments refused to pay the debt for the grain. Isn't that crazy? So the idea here was, the fact that they, the, the, the new French government was saying like, wait, that was Napoleon. We had nothing to do with that. We're not paying you anymore, which is absurd, right? Because as a nation, when you owe a debt, it doesn't matter if we're talking about the US, for example, it doesn't matter if the, if the debt was acquired under Trump, under Obama, under Bush, US owes money, the US shall pay it. You know, the, Trump can't then turn around and say, 
you know, now that was Barack or Barack can't turn around and say, no, that was Bush, right? The nation owes the debt. So this is very ridiculous that the, the, the French were saying this. So this, this leads to disputes between Algeria and, and France. And, you know, between that and other mat uh, matters led to a break of diplomatic relations between France and Algeria in 1927. And in 1830, right in 1830 the french uh a diplomatic incident happens in 1830 where where france decides to invade uh to invade algeria right and they use the excuse here right they use the excuse that we are doing this to end piracy around algiers you know so, but this is a common excuse, right? They, you hear this all the time where a country wants to invade some, some other country and they'll come up with a story. It could be, you know, with the um, Magdan incident in the 1930s where Japan claimed that China had bombed a part of their railway. It could be, uh, I can't remember what country it was, wink, wink, that said there was uh, weapons of mass destruction in, in, in Iraq. Uh, and so forth, right? So this is, you create some fake pretext. So they were saying, in fact, piracy was no longer a serious threat to powerfully protected European shipping in the Mediterranean, but they still use that as a reason that the Fr French to invade. So they do. So they invade Algeria in 1830. And make no mistake about it, they faced very stiff resistance, right? face very stiff resistance. Now, up to that point, up to that point, uh, Algeria was really just made up of many nomadic and semi-nomadic clans uh, where, you know, and, and other uh, clans of Muslim brotherhoods, Sufi brotherhoods, right? That uh, were actually known for their own rivalries and frequent raids and warfare between themselves. So to say that it would have been easy to, to invade them is, is an understatement, right? Because like they're not unified. However, then rises this guy pictured here, Abdi Al-Qadir, Abdi Al-Qadir. Right? And Al-Qadir means the great. And, you know, he was a holy man, you know, a marabout as they would call it. We had come from Western Algeria. And what he set out to do right, was to organize the interiors, Berber-speaking population to resist the French, right? And what he played on was the fact that French invasion, even though they hated Ottoman rule over them, there was a couple of things that really upset them. The first one, that, that he could appeal to these different groups, like the Berbers and the, and, the, and the Sufi brotherhoods. The first one was that the French, unlike the Ottomans were, Christian, right? So you so saw already, and these guys are Muslim already. So even though the Ottomans are there, are their colonizers, if you will, they are still Muslim. So it's it's almost the less of the two evil situation. The second thing is also like I've been stressing that the Ottoman rule was almost nominal at this stage. They were pretty much left to their own devices. If the French were to come in, they were almost certainly going to be more heavy-handed in their rule. Okay, so Abdi Al-Qadir is able to appeal to this and he called for a jihad and, 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 uh, and drew on the, on the Sufi brotherhoods to organize and unify the forces. And, uh, you know, the French colonizers are gonna do colonial things, right? Actually offered Al-Qadir the position of governor of Western Algeria, uh, sort of to take him out of the reckoning, but he wasn't with it. Um, so, you know, they, 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 they kept at it, man. And of course, the, and actually one of the things that they were able to do was to start making their own guns, right? And by making, I put made, made in, in, in quotations here because although the guns were imported from Europe, many were also made and repaired by the Algerians themselves. So it was really a lot of repair work, but they were very advanced in that. So they were able to fight on, um, but in 1837, the French were able to break resistance in the east and turn their energies against Abdi al-Qadir. 
and eventually in 1847, Alcadia surrendered. You know, the, the French used scorched earth warfare, exploited local rivalries, and, you know, Alcadia was finally, uh, finally surrendered in 1847. In 1847, he surrendered. And um, he was captured and exiled that year. However, this resistance never fully stopped until 1879, when uh, that's when we can say like, okay, this was the time that the French could really claim to have pacified Algeria. And what that does is it opens the door for what we call colons, right? The colonizers, colons. This was the name given to the Europeans who came in and settled here uh in the in the area and by 1871 right already even before it was fully pacified 130,000 colons had already moved in to 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 algeria by 1900 1 million of them had moved there right um when this actually made up for 13 percent of the entire population and as as colonizers would do they pushed uh the, the, the French, uh, they pushed the Algerian farmers off their land, took all the best land. Um, Muslim Algerians were brought under strict control and their freedom was restricted, much like we will see with the Hottentot code in South Africa. And finally, the thing that they'd been very afraid of or that they'd been worried about, Islamic law was overridden by French law. So in their own country, Muslim Algerians were now regarded as alien and, and, and inferior. So this is, um, you know, this is, this is, they were colonized at this point. Now this is in 1879, but we see that this process starts earlier in 1830, um, indeed. Oh, another interesting thing too to think about as we think about North Africa is the fact that when you think about the scramble for Africa, a lot of us will point to the Berlin Conference of 1884, 1885, which is when a lot of the interior of Africa was split apart and given to the different European countries. But here, as we talk about North Africa, you see that the, Euro, the scramble for Africa by the European, Western European nation that started even before then, and the French in Algeria is one such example. And we're gonna keep talking about the French as we begin to talk about, I believe the um, 19th century Egypt. Now, this one is very, very fascinating, right? Because it's Egypt. Egypt is always a is always a good time to talk about, uh, you know. Um, in seventeen ninety eight, a French army commanded by the young general, right, Napoleon Bonaparte, inv invades Egypt. So why why would the would the French invade Egypt? Now this is thirty years or so before they before they, they, they get into Algeria. And remember, this is the, ex, the military exploits for which Algeria had provided Napoleon with grain that we just spoke about, right? So why was Napoleon so keen to seize Egypt? There's a few reasons. One of them was France was short on food at this point, right? They were surrounded by uh, adversaries in Europe and they had mobilized the, the French population for war, right? So much is going on in France, they need food, right? So this is a great place for them to, to, to start seeking food. And Egypt is very fertile as we've seen, you know, time and again, um, you know, so the grain that they could get from Egypt, right? Could, could really help save or prevent famine in France. Egypt is also a major producer of cotton which would help France develop a textile industry that would rival Britain, who is their historic rival. And also remember that uh, a very important thing too was this conflict with the, the Anglo-French conflict seems to go back to the, to the Seven Years' War of 1756 to 1763. And although Britain had subsequently lost the, the you know, in the American Revolution, the British had still got in Canada, many Caribbean islands, right? And above all, India. So France, on the other hand, had lost out to Britain in both India and, and in North Africa and in the Seven Years' War. 
and in the 1790s was in the process of losing her most profitable Caribbean colony to the slave revolt in Haiti. Let's just say Napoleon here was keen to break the French losing streak against the British. You've beaten us in Canada. You've beaten us in the islands. You got ahead of us and, and got into India. So, so in 1798, they're able to get in, right? Look, so far, so good. Um, and, and also a large part of this that we cannot do away with was the personal ambition of Napoleon, right? Napoleon was, uh, he was keen on building a name for himself. In many ways, he modeled, modeled, modeled himself after Alexander the Great, uh, who had conquered Egypt and led his armies through Western Asia, right? And he wanted to create a similar empire of the Orient with himself as the leader. He had this, he had this, uh, he had this, he had this ambition, right? Like many prominent colonizers do. Um, and also another thing that he did was he actually attempted to present himself and his troops as liberators of Egypt from the Ottomans, claiming that not only had he come to free Egypt from the Ottoman domination, but he himself was also Muslim, right? And although many Egyptians disliked the Ottomans, they did not seem, uh, they did not prefer the French, right? Much like the Algerians later on would also be not sold on the French. So how does the battle go out? In 1798, the French uh, fought the main Egyptian army north of Cairo. Uh, and, um, and, and Napoleon, uh, who himself saw himself as a successor of the pharaohs, pretentious, pretentiously called the Battle of the Pyramids, the Battle of the Pyramids, right? And that's what's generally pictured here, the Battle of the Pyramids. And you know, even though they were outnumbered, they, they won that, that war. Uh, by the end of the day, the Egyptian army had put had been put to flight with the loss of many thousands of men, including up to 2,000 of the Mamluks elite cavalry, uh, and the French lost maybe like 150 people. So, so, so that happens. And the, the Bays, right, the Bays, the Bays, V-E-Ys, who are the leaders who put up this valiant resistance end up fleeing with uh, with Ibrahim Bey retreating to Syria and Murad Bey retreating into Upper Egypt. You would think that the French had a thing going for them in here, right? Uh, they just defeated this army, but no, days after the French victory, days <laughs> after the French victory outside Cairo, the British Navy annihilated the French fleet <laughs> at anchor in a bay to the east of Alexandria. The British pretentiously called it the Battle of the Nile. So, you know, they were cut off from supplies and reinforcements and Napoleon's attempt uh, to, to spread into Syria was defeated. And the following year, right, he ditches the army and made his way back to, to France to seize power in the French capital. And in 1801, an Ottoman army backed by the British forced the remnants of the French army out of Egypt, which makes you wonder like, what was that even about, right? <laughs> what was it all about? All right, so what's the big deal? Why do, would we even talk about the French if they were just there for three years and it's just the Ottoman who came back with the support of the British at this point? Very good question. These three years, 1798 to 1801 of French rule, or maybe not even French rule, but of French presence in Egypt are important for few reasons. First, right, Napoleon here, after the, the bays, right, the, the Mamluk bays uh, fled, um, that power had been undermined by Napoleon, which sort of began laying the foundation for a modern civil state, uh, which we'll talk about more uh, after this. Secondly, the French invasion marked the beginnings of the Anglo-French rivalry in Egypt that was to dominate uh, Egypt's history right up into the 20th century. And finally, it's also worth noting that when the French got there, they meticulously recorded ancient Egyptian religious and artistic work. And this was also when the Rosetta Stone was discovered. 
in many ways, this begins the obsess obsessive study of Egypt, which we call Egyptology today, right? So those, those years were important for those reasons, right? Also, a, a funny little anecdote here that I may add is the fact that if you've ever seen the, the Sphinx in Egypt, right? You'll see that its nose is, is shattered. For a long time, there was a rumor that one of Napoleon's cannons did that. Um, you know, the, you know, the, it's widely debunked now as a myth because one, if, 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 if a cannon had hit that, the damage would have been a little more significant um, and so forth. But it, it, it stems from this era here. However, so the Ottomans come back, auto, British back Ottomans take control in 1801. In the wings here, right, in the wings was a, was a guy named Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali, who was an Albanian officer uh, who had commanded some of the troops that had driven the French out in 1801. After a period of political maneuvering and with the backing of Egyptian um, ulama who are religious scholars, Muhammad Ali was named Pasha in 1805. To say Pasha is to say the, the, the ruler, the governor, right? So he's, he's the you know, he's of Albanian descent, he's, an, he's Albanian, part of the Ottoman Empire, and is now the governor of, of, the, of, of, of Egypt beginning in 1805. And this guy was very fascinating. He preferred many ways, in many ways, he preferred a uh, European way of doing things, right? Advice, technology. He developed a salaried civil service a modern professional army, both modeled on, on, on European rather than African or Asian lines. Um, so for this reason, he's often regarded as the founder of modern Egypt or the modernizer of Egypt, right? And indeed, many Egyptians themselves view him as the founder of modern Egypt. However, what is also important when we say this claim is problematic is for one or two reasons, right? Oh, he did a lot. Let, let me just go through some of the other things he did. Um, he invested heavily in new roads, infrastructure, and sanitation. However, some of these efforts made Muhammad Ali even less popular with the Egyptian masses than the Mamluks and the French had been, right? This one I said the fun of, of, uh, of modern Egypt is a problematic claim because. The Egypt, 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 this benefited uh, the elites in Egypt, but not the masses. The Egyptian population in 1820s was 2.5 million, 90% of whom were fellahin, the peasants we've spoken about before. Despised Muhammad Ali, despised, he, Muhammad Ali despised them as barbarians. He called them barbarians. He, uh, even though the, the fellahin had always been exploited, Muhammad Ali ratcheted up their exploitation to, um, to incredible levels, such that on top of their usual taxation and forced labor, they were forcibly constricted into the, conscripted into the army. So when they revolted in, in the 1820s, they were, they were brutally suppressed, right? Um, and some have even tried to present Muhammad Ali as an anti-European -Euro crusader or as an early Arab nationalist, which is ridiculous because you know he wasn't even Arab. But uh, you know what he really was, was was an ambitious leader who just wanted to exploit, expand his power by whatever means necessary. Another thing that he also did was he took over uh, the Mamluk um, farms, right? He sought out to destroy them. Furthermore, he in 1811, he organized the massacre of several, several hundred of the Mamluk Bays, and the remainder fled the country to take refuge in Dongola, uh, which is in, in, in modern Sudan. So, and he took over for he took over the Mamluk states for himself, um, and so forth. So this is this is a very you see how long he ruled 1805 to 1849. Muhammad Ali, very influential leader, re, regarded by some as the modern as the founder of modern Egypt, criticized by some as being a, a prototypical European imperialist who 
only further the cause of, of, of the elites, even as an Ottoman leader. So let's see, I think I have a picture here of, of, of the guy. Oh, sorry, before we get there, I was teaching this class and one of my students made this meme. Shout out, Corey, uh, if you ever watch this. Uh, this is the part about Napoleon claiming to be Muslims to sort of uh, uh, get a um, get into the good graces of of the Egyptians, right? Which didn't work, but uh, I thought this was just a classic meme. Um, yeah, Muhammad Ali. Oh, wait, I don't think this is the same Muhammad Ali, is it? No, this is the great boxer, uh, formerly named Cassius Clay, uh, phenomenal fighter. Uh, real hero, uh, <laughs> but not, not that Muhammad Ali. So this is that Muhammad Ali, not quite as, as, as pretty as the, the first Muhammad Ali, but very important as well to, to the history of, to the history of, of North Africa, right? So this is him, Muhammad Ali Pasha, right? This is what his bio says on, 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 on um, Britannica. An Ottoman was an Ottoman governor of Egypt, often referred to as the founder of modern Egypt. He ruled over Lower Egypt, Upper Egypt, Sudan, which we'll talk about, and parts of Arabia and the Levant during his reign. Ali was born in Kavala, Ottoman Macedonia, and had Albanian origins. He and his family controlled Egypt for over 147 years and their influence can still be seen in modern Alexandrian culture and its culture. Although he reached Egypt as a Turkish army officer, he ended up ruling the nation for most of his life. He was sent there to recover Egypt from French occupation that was earlier ruled by Napoleon. Once Napoleon withdrew from Egypt, Ali rose to power thanks to his political prowess. He became the viceroy of Egypt and attained the rank of Pasha. He brought in a lot of reforms in the military, economic and cultural spheres and paved the way for the modernization of Egypt. He is also credited for ending the Mamluk reign over Egypt and he and his descendants ruled Egypt for up, up until the mid 20th century. So this is an end quote. So this is some of the things that I've been talking about here, but that's Muhammad Ali. Okay. Now, in addition to all these things that we've already spoken about Muhammad Ali being a larger than life figure, one thing that you cannot doubt was his ambition. So for a long time, around the 1820s, beginning in the 1820s, he set out to expand his authority over the entire Ottoman empire. Now let that sit in for a little bit. He had been brought in as a governor of Egypt as part of the Ottoman Empire. But now he had his sights set on taking over the whole thing, such that in 1825, he occupied the island of Crete. And by the early 1830s, he had occupied much of the middle of, the, of what we call the Middle East today. Um, and by the late, eight, by the early to mid 1830s, he was already threatening uh, Istanbul, him and his armies. And to make matters worse, the Ottoman Navy defected and joined Muhammad Ali in 1839, which made the situation even grimmer. You know, you're getting in trouble when your when your sections of your military, the Navy defect to join the threat, right? But the European powers were not, you know, you'd have thought since this guy was very pro-European and was doing a lot of business with them, you would have thought that they might support this move. But the European powers, actually were against this, right? They told him to withdraw. Um, and in fact, British Australian fleet landed uh, troops in Beirut and threatened to, uh, to split Muhammad Ali's forces into two. So, and Muhammad Ali, for all the things, his force, he was no fool. So he decided to withdraw his forces and settle for just the control of Egypt. So why? Why would the Egyptians, I mean, why would the Europeans not want this guy to take over? Simply put, the Ottoman Empire, as we said time and again, was now a shadow of his former self. And having somebody as ambitious as Muhammad Ali would definitely reinvigorate the Ottoman Empire. And the European uh, uh, powers did not want to uh, deal 
with a rejuvenated Ottoman Empire, re rejuvenated uh, Ottoman state, they'd rather deal with the weaker one, right? Because this is the era of their own expansion. So uh, Muhammad Ali, you know, he would buy a lot of arms and all these other things to, 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 from, from Europe. And um, the Europeans would get raw materials and a market for their manufactured goods. They wanted to keep it at that level. They were not interested in, in the Ottoman Empire being a peer to them. They wanted to keep it as a client state. So that's what this was about. So as it were, he ended up dying in, in 1847 um, after, after he had failed to, to take over the, 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 um, the Ottoman Empire as he had so desired. The name spot exactly the same way as, as the boxes. So that's a little bit trippy. Um, so what happens during Muhammad Ali's rule? Uh, of course, increased European in investment under, under Muhammad Ali, right? In, employ, he employed a lot of European advisors, officers, bureaucrats, army officers, right? This, these are the people who helped quote unquote modernize Egypt. Uh, to these bureaucrats and army officers and the likes, some of the other European in investment that came in was in the form of um, heavy British investment in railway construction in the 1850s, right, which connected the Mediterranean uh, port of Alexandria to Cairo and the Red Sea port of Suez. In 1859, uh, the French began building a canal linking the Mediterranean, Mediterranean to the Red Sea at Suez, right? And who, you know, wonder what they'll eventually call this canal, right? So thereafter, you know, uh, by then, uh, Muhammad Ali is, is gone, you know, but, you know, I think he died in 1849. So these are his descendants, right? One of them, his grandson, Saeed, uh, and later Ismail came in and something is happening in the world in the 1860s that, led to an increase in the price of cotton. You know what it is? It's the American Civil War, right? So as the American Civil War is happening, these guys are encouraged and they, you know, by the high cotton prices and, and they, they, they spend a lot on, 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 on infrastructure, right? Because, you know, they, they have this commodity that is very popular around the world and that is very highly priced in the, in the US, which has been a main supplier until now. And they're able to build on that. However, what happens after the war ends, after the Civil War ends in, in the US, the price of cotton starts to go down again, right? Um, Egypt's vast indebtedness to European nations started to show. So with the opening of the Suez Canal, right, in 1869, the Europeans started to just entirely just dominate uh, commerce in Egypt. Let's talk about the Suez Canal a little more here, right? So how was it financed? Well, it was financed largely, <laughs> largely by the Egyptians themselves, right? It cost $19 million to build, or 19 million pounds, right? And there had been, the, you know, the, the 19 million pounds, the Egyptians had paid 15 of the 19 million, right? That's more than, 75%, that's more than three fourths of it. And the French had given the other 4 million. The debt is a debt. However, as Egypt's finances became overstretched in the 1870s, right? The British seized the opportunity to buy the Egyptian share of the canal in 1875 for a mere $4 million. They paid 15 million for it. They were bought out for a mere $4 million, right? With this action, the British were able to safeguard their route to India, and at the same time became deeply committed to, to sort of securing their investment in Egypt. So the Suez Canal, if you don't know, is a very important, I wish I had it on I had the actual, its actual location on the map, but you can look it up, Suez Canal, because at this point, right, if you're going from Western Europe to, to the Arabian Peninsula or to Asia, to India, 
you may have to go down the Atlantic Ocean, right? Down past South Africa into the Indian Ocean and up or, or other such ways, right? But the most effective way is if you can build a canal that connects, that connects um, the Mediterranean to the Red Sea at, at, at you know, the Suez Canal. That's what, that's what it's there for. It cuts the trip by significant amounts, by you say 90%. It is the most convenient way. It's become more significant even in the 20th century with the rise of oil usage. So that's how people get there, which is why I think it was in 2020 or 2021, this is what this meme is about, where a ship, a Japanese ship known as Evergreen blocked you know, uh, the Swiss Canal, and it was a huge international crisis, right? Indeed. Uh, so that's what that's about. Now, the British and the French are now in control of the finances of the 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 the, 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 the of of Egypt, right? After Ismail, who's uh, Mohammed Ali, had admitted that the country was bankrupt, um, you know and they're just in dual control of the thing. So what happens? From this rises a more nationalistic, a populistic um, figure known as Urabi Pasha, right? Urabi Pasha was the son of indigenous Egypt fella, you know, like the fella him, uh, Ahmad Urabi, right? That was his real name, but he was known as Urabi Pasha. Rises, he says, you know what? Screw this being ruled by the British and the French and the Ottoman for what it matters, right? As represented by Muhammad Ali and his descendants. Uh, he rises in power and in 1881, he became minister for war. And, and he wanted to declare some sort of independent and accountable democratic government, right? Started to rally the people with, uh, with this idea of Egypt for Egyptians, right? That was his cause, Egypt for Egyptians. Um, and it, it rallies the people, right? That, you know, we can't be oppressed like this anymore. And in fact, uh, and, and he was pretty successful, uh, but eventually he was defeated in 1882 and exiled to Ceylon, which is modern day uh, Sri Lanka. Um, then after that, this episode at which even though it was still sort of nominally an Ottoman <laughs> uh, territory under a puppet, puppet figures who are uh, Muhammad Ali's descendants. The way that British came into power here, right? Albeit keeping an Ottoman empire is, is, pretty, is pretty grimy. So uh, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna read a quote from this book. This is Shillington uh, talking about, about, this, about how this happened and why the French resented them for it. Quote, the British and French preempted this, right, Urabi's attack by sending a naval force to blockade Alexandria in May, 1882. The year before, the French had blockaded Tunis as a preliminary to the occupation of Tunisia. Urabi responded by strengthening the defenses of Alexandria. Tensions mounted in the city between Europeans and Egyptians and in June, anti-imperial riots left 50 Europeans dead. The, this provided the British with the excuse to commence a naval bombardment of the city, focusing in particular on destroying Urabi's reinforcements. The French, busy quelling uh, resistance in Tunisia, withdrew their ships from the blockade, leaving the British free to land a naval force and occupy Alexandria. Urabi withdrew his forces to defend Cairo. Four weeks later, a large British army invaded Egypt from the Suez Canal. Um, end quote. I want to mention that here because from then on, isn't that crazy? That for a moment, they looked like the British and the French were working together, but the French had to leave real quick to go handle some other business and the Brit British went on and asserted themselves in the region, which uh, again, doesn't gel well for, for people that were already sort of against each other. All right, so you know this, let's talk a little bit about Sudan, right? Let's talk a little bit about Sudan. Muhammad Ali in 1820, right? Right, you know, it started ruling in 1805. In 1820, he decides to invade Sudan, which is to the immediate south of Egypt. 
Why is that? Well, remember we said in 1811, he had killed a lot of, a lot of the Mamluks and many of them had fled to, to Dongola in, in Sudan. He was, he was pursuing them. So he went over there um, to, to make sure he massacred the rest of them. And yeah, so in 1822, 1821, he, he went into Sudan and scattered the remaining Mamluks and also captured a lot of slaves um, for, for, for his own army, for, his, for the Egyptian army. Um, and indeed, so, so they were able to do this with, with very little resistance early on, uh, but in, in the 1880s, beginning in 1881, a holy man, Muhammad Ahmad, was who called himself the Mahdi, which means the guided one, rose up as a savior who would restore Muslim, Muslim purity uh, to, to, to the Sudan. So he called for a jihad, you know, uh, to, to push the Ali, uh, to push uh, Muhammad Ali's descendants out. And they actually fought, they actually fought strongly and were able to seize back the capital city Khartoum in 1885. However, you know, the, they'd spent so much energy in, in, in fighting that when it came time to rule, they were pretty weakened. So the Magdis state was finally destroyed by a huge Anglo-Egyptian army sent in 1898. Um, 11,000 Sudanese were slaughtered by the British and Egyptian machine guns and artillery. And only 48 of the Anglo-Egyptian army were killed. So uh, that's a landslide, right? So it is also at this point that uh, Sudan essentially became a, a sort of a British colony. Um, for the rest of the colonial era, indeed. Now, Ethiopia, right? <laughs> Ethiopia is always my favorite to talk about. Ethiopia had been, remember we spoke about some of those conflicts that had been happening in Ethiopia uh, back in the day um, with the Sultanate of Adal, of, of Adal rising, the Portuguese coming to the aid of the, of the Ethiopians. This is only the 17th century. And uh, while that dueling for control was happening, Ethiopia had never been as, we had not been as unified as it had been maybe like under the, in the Lalibela years, um, in the Solomonic dynasty and so forth, right? It was really just a bunch of different uh, provinces within the Ethiopian kingdom sort of doing their own thing, acting independently since the 18th century, we've even seen the Oromos coming in from, from the highlands and it really, you know, nobody checking for them, right? You have this different group sort of going at it here. In fact, the emperor of Ethiopia at the time was actually known as the King of Kings, which sounds amazing, godlike, right? But what it actually meant was quite the opposite of that. He was the king of very sovereign other leaders, right? Uh, and this would change in 1855, 1855, where this guy known as Lij Kasa Hailu was the governor of one of the provinces of the Western province of Kwara. Uh, he had fought back, you know, there'd been some scuffles with the Egyptians back and forth uh, prior to this, and he had learned a lot from this, right? He had learned a lot from this that he, decided that he would maybe the best way to go about resisting any further such attacks is to unify um, to unify the, uh, the, the the provinces. So he took power, right? The, and the title of Emperor Theodros, which is Theodore the second, right? Um, he starts to unify See, he seizes the imperial throne, starts to consolidate uh, control by, by hook and by crook, right? Military, mil militarily and by guile. He expanded his own regular military force into a national army, right? Drilled, disciplined, and salaried, you know, trained them to use modern firearms. And between 1855 and 1861, uh, many regional rebellions 
as the local nobility tried to reassert their, their independence, but they were savagely put down, right? Um, so, but what this also means is even as he's unifying these groups, a lot of the nobility resent him, right? They resent him um, as well. Another group that was very important to, to Ethiopian history to this day was the church and they also resented him. Why do they resent him? Um, he set out to abolish the, the privileges of the clergy, confiscated many of the huge church estates, uh, leaving each parish with just enough land to support a minimum handful of clergy. So when you lose the support of the church in Ethiopia, right, you, it essentially lost him the legitimacy of his imperial title. Um, so yeah, so it was largely church influence that persuaded uh, a majority of Ethiopians to desert their emperor in the time of his greatest need. So what happens? What is this time of greatest need? In 1868, there was a small diplomatic scuffle with the British and he arrested the local British consul, like the ambassador. Now the British, again, colonizers are gonna, are gonna colonize, right? One person had been arrested. The British sent an army of 30,000 men to rescue, quote unquote, the, 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 what they called hostages, but they're prisoners, right? Because people get arrested. And so they came in and at the Battle of Magdala, Tuodros only had 4,000 men because their other people were beholden to their, no, no, uh, to their nobility and they were not willing to participate in this war. Um, so they were handily defeated and Tuodros, you know, decided to commit suicide rather than face capture, right? He commits suicide and uh, the British lose the capital and withdraw. Uh, and, the, and the British were left feeling like, you know what? Ethiopia would always be easy to colonize, right? To, to conquer, they are weak, which hint, hint, it's not the case. And we won't talk about it in this video. Maybe we'll hint at it. But again, Ethiopia proved to be <laughs> one of the few two countries in Africa, right? One of the rare African countries that was never colonized. Uh, but this is people here, felt, the Europeans felt like it would be easy for the taking. So what happens after this guy? Another guy, known as Tej Kasa, who was coming from the Tigray area, right? Uh, came into power. He had actually assisted. He had actually marched on the side of the British, which is why you can see here. Oh, we didn't talk about my man's cornrows here, man. He's styling back in the day with the cornrows. <laughs> uh, but here you see this guy, uh, Joe, you know, Tej Kasa of Tigray looking very different, right? Not too British, but he looks different from the other guy. He had marched on the side of the British uh, against, uh, against uh, Teodros, and he, was de he declared himself successor to Teodros. He, of course, had the British support, right? He had rifles to defeat, but uh, by 1872, he had crowned himself as Johannes IV, John IV, right? Johannes IV. Uh, he returned, and what he did was he returned regional power to the nobles, right, which makes him sort of popular with those guys. Uh, and also returned some of the church's privileges, okay, um, which again made him popular and actually gave him a much bigger army which with, with which he was able to repel, uh, you know, any threat from Muslim Egypt up in the north. Um, the other main external threat came from east where the Italians had declared a colony in, in, in over the ports of Asaba and Masawa in 1882 and 1885. Johannes defeated a force of 500 Italians pretty easily in 1887. Now, this is crazy right here. This is crazy because the Italians, right, were very new to the scramble for Africa. They, Italy had only just unified and they were just eager to get into the action there. So they sent 500 troops to Italy in 1887, or I mean, to in the 1880s, they conquered this, these spaces of Saab and Masawa, and they're handily defeated by Teodros, I mean, by Johannes IV, sorry, Johannes IV. After his term is done, he is succeeded by uh, Menelik II. And Menelik II, is an incredible leader. Because we have to think about who the first Menelik is, right? 
The first Menelik goes back to, I believe, is the child of, of Solomon and Sheba and the queen of Sheba. That's the first Menelik. So when he says it's Menelik the second, is situating himself within the historical trajectory when uh, the Ethiopians think of themselves as the chosen people, a lot of it is rooted in their bloodline coming down from Menelik. So when this guy, he is really the chosen one, right? Menelik the second, he comes into power, uh, succeeded the imperial throne at the death of Johannes in 1889. Um, he established his capital at Addis Ababa, where it remains today, right? And he also set out to expand. What these other folks had done was maybe to reunify Ethiopia, but uh, Menelik sets back to expanding it, right? He brings in uh, different groups such as the non-Christian Oromo, Sidama, Somali, were brought within the empire. And, uh, and, and so this is where Ethiopia really grows, right? Then the Italians, having been defeated in 1887, were not willing to accept this defeat, right? So they come back in 1896. And I'll put a video to a YouTube, uh, a, YouTube, a YouTube link to a video, not by myself, of course. Some folks have done some amazing work in this. So I'll find which one is the best one, and I'll put it in the description box, because you really have to hear about the 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 battle of Adwa in 18, in 18, 1896. In any case, in a nutshell, and also if you watch my other video, I'll put the link on this on the Africa and the Second World War. I go into more depth about this. Um, but in any case, the Italians come back and with a far bigger army, right? I don't know what they were expecting because they just was in 1887, but they brought a lot more people and they were resoundingly defeated by Benelik's vastly superior army at the Battle of Adwa and in, you know, in 1896. And this effectively saved Ethiopia from European colonial conquest during the era of the scramble for Africa. So when you say Ethiopia was never colonized, it wasn't for a lack of trying, right? The Ita Italians actually came in in 1896 and were handily defeated by Menelik II. They tried again in 1935, and that's what my other video on the Second World War focuses on. I'll put that in the, in the description box as well. So that's it, right? We've spoken a lot about uh, Algeria and the resistance movements there led by uh, the, the colonization of Algeria um, by, um, by the French, then Abdi al qadir leading resistance, then we spoke about the Battle of the Pyramids and the Battle of Now and how the Europeans came into Egypt in that era. Then Albanian um, Ottoman autocrat Muhammad Ali and his descendants would rule Egypt for a long time. We spoke about the Suez Canal. Then we also spoke about how Muhammad Ali got into Sudan. And now we just spoke about the leaders who reunified Ethiopia and the struggles that they faced right up until 1895. So now we are in the era of the scramble for Africa. And what are some of the big takeaways? You may want to engage with these points here, uh, you know, to, to just make sure you flesh this out. I'll put my sources. Uh, two of the most prominent sources I've used in putting this lecture together are History of Africa, the fourth edition by Kevin Sillington, as well as as well as um, Africa in World History by Eric Gilbert and Jonathan T. Reynolds. So these are the books that I've used. I will stop sharing now. And I'm so glad you guys uh, hung out with me. I've been meaning to do this for a while. Uh, it was my pleasure. I hope you enjoyed this video. And if you did, make sure to like the video, subscribe, comment. Uh, you know, let me know what you think in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the comment section and share it with somebody who can share it with somebody else. Thank you guys so much. And till next time, one.